be recorded and available for public consumption. Um, all right, we are recording. Thank you very much for joining us for the second ESTA Standards Roundtable. Uh, we did one of these last night and it seemed to go pretty well. This is being recorded so that it will be available as a resource for people to find in the future. We'll likely make it available through the, the ESTA website as well as the rdmprotocol.org website for people if they have questions or want to refer colleagues to this in the future. We have four panelists with us today um, and a number of other people who may be able to help us answer questions as they come up. There's no formal agenda. We're going to go through kind of a brief overview and presentation. And then if there are questions or things to help guide us, otherwise, I think among the four of us here, we can talk for an hour, can't we? <laughs> so let's start with some introductions. Um, my name is Eric Johnson. I've been volunteering with the ESTA Technical Standards Program for a number of years now. Um, I currently work for Cisco Systems, not working in the entertainment industry at all. Um, but I've stayed involved as a, it is an absolutely fascinating work to do. Wayne, do you want to? Um, Wayne Howe from Artistic License, involved in the TSP uh, program for, for many, many years, and um, art net inventor, and uh, re recently very involved in dealing with issues of arbitration between streaming NCN and art net open. And also an author of one of the commonly recommended books on entertainment. Um, which many of you have, have likely run into. Jason, you want to? Uh, my name is Jason Potter with Cisco, formerly though of high end systems, and uh, now working with Cisco on the digitization of architectural lighting in office areas. So we're bringing lighting fixtures onto uh, POE as a deployment technology. And we have several interests in IP uh, protocols for lighting control. All right, and Maya. I'm Maya Nagarosh. I work for EGC. I'm currently one of the co chairs for the Info Protocol for Eaters at the Smoker. I was also the chair of the most recent revision of the Streaming ACM. I'm one of the two co chairs of the current revision of the Streaming ACM. All right. And also, we have Scott Blair, who will be serving as kind of a moderator and taking questions today um, for anything that's submitted via the chat panel. Uh, generally, we're going to follow show rules on ClearCom. Stay on mute unless you're speaking. Um, and you do have the ability to unmute yourself, but just by, by clicking the mute icon by your name in the attendee list. And, but in general, it's probably easiest to submit questions via the chat window, because then we can address them at a time that it's convenient and, and appropriate. So <clears throat> entertainment networks, entertainment applications use networks very differently than your typical IT office environment. In fact, many IT network administrators have been known to issue expletives when they see the traffic and the traffic patterns and the way that we use networks. So often, it's us, the people who are building systems, who are working as systems integrators, who end up educating the IT people on how to use the network and why we need it that way. Maya, do you want to address what are some of the things that are so different about entertainment networks from what you typically see? In an office, I, I think. Mean, that's a great question. I, mean, I think one of the biggest things that we've embraced in the entertainment community is our use of multicast, um, which is, you know, normally if you talk to your IT provider, the person can decide to turn off. Yep. And if you try and run multicast over the internet, you can't. Well, I mean, we're not trying to control systems over the internet yet. Uh, yep. Okay. So there's been a lot of classic, you know, for years there's been quite a number of proprietary protocols that have been used in the industry. Everything from various versions of ETCnet to ArtNet. Um, everybody seemed to have their own. You know, some of them were open and available for anybody to implement. Some of them were, you know, it worked only with, those, with that vendor's equipment or under non-disclosure. Those still exist. There's a lot of them out there. You see a lot of them on networks. Um, just looking around the room here, what's the most different control protocols you've seen on a single show? Four. Four, okay. Yeah, I think four's about it. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Artnet, Streaming, ACN, ShowNet, and KineNet. I think yeah, I've yeah. seen. KineNet, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I would say, I'd say on um, shows like the Oscar, probably about seven, I can think of. Okay. So we're really seeing a lot more of this. 
really what we wanted to focus on today is things you need to know about multicast. Multicast works a little differently at all layers of networking than you're probably used to. And there's some key concepts and terms that people in the entertainment industry need to know about. We're not going to turn this into a how to configure your network. We're not going to turn, we're not going to turn this into a you know, hex dumps of packet traffic. But we just kind of want to, want to discuss concepts and things you might need to think about when you're building a large entertainment network. Jason, can you, can you give some background and basics on multicast and how, how it's used? Sure. So the really multicast was one of those things, that, and, and this is the thing you get into when you start researching networks, is there's often a chasm between what is standardized and what is actually used. And for the vast majority of traffic on the internet, you're looking at TCP, IP, and most of it is V4, and that service is most of what people need. Uh, multicast came about mostly in local area networks, and honestly, today in the business world, the number one use of multicast, believe it or not, is a uh, hold music for IP phones. So you're, you have a, a ton of clients on the phone waiting for someone to pick up the phone. No reason to send that data 200 copies of it to 200 different people on the phone. Instead, you just send one stream that the network infrastructure is smart enough to send that one packet to all the places that uh, are interested in receiving that packet. You do save a lot of bandwidth that way when you have the same piece of information going to multiple places. You're not sending multiple copies. Um, there really are three, and with IPv6, there are four forms of transmission. There's unicast, which is point-to-point, -point, mm -hmm. what most people think. Uh, there's broadcast, which is sending to everyone on a certain area of the network. And then, of course, you have multicast, which is transmitting to some. And those mostly cover most, uh, most applications and what people need. Broadcast is used very sparingly because it's very hard on the network. Unicast is preferred, and multicast is used uh, where the application merits. And lighting control is one of the few places where the application really does merit a new transmission medium. So most of the IP multicast infrastructure that is out there is really meant for media applications, music and video, IP television type applications. A lot of, I'm not going to say most, but a lot of what we see in entertainment networks today is transporting DMX. You take what was a DMX universe on a 485 wire and you're transporting it over a network now, which actually maps really well to looking like streaming video because it's constant data, it's always there, and it's frequent. But you don't care if you lose a frame or two. Obviously, if you're doing IMAG on a live show, you don't want to lose a frame or two. But if you lose a frame or two of DMX data every now and again, most of your audience isn't going to notice. So we end up using a lot of the infrastructure that is intended for IP television and, I, and applications. Now, in this discussion, we're really going to stick to IPv4. IPv6 is coming to our industry. There are some people that are using it internally. But all of the ESTA standards today, and most of what's out there is working at IPv4. So we're going to really focus on that today. We might mention a few key terms from IPv6. And I will mention this is a bit of a shame. A lot of the trouble that technicians see in the field associated with IPv4 are really solved by IPv6. And if we had the luxury of starting from scratch, I think if the industry could choose, they would have picked IPv6. Uh, so look for that. A lot of people think it's going to make their lives harder, but really, it, once it comes and takes over, it'll make a lot of things easier. So, Wayne, what, what was a big show 15 years ago as far as number of universes? And what's a big show today for number of universes? <laughs> I think 15 years ago, it has was proved by the fact that we used four universes as a multiple product. Four universes was considered to be huge. Um, and um, I'm clearly it's not the case anymore. Um, whether, the, whether the difference between our net and streaming ACM and 30,000 and 60,000 universes will, will matter is a uh, subject of debate, but probably at some point. So, um, but, but realistically, um, we're at a universe count where the network infrastructure now matters. 
Um, we certainly don't want to be broadcasting data, and we want to make we want to make sure that when we're multicasting data, the infrastructure is working for us and not against us. The phrase kilobert, the word kilobers has been used. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we're getting reports from some of the theme parks that they're using twenty seven thousand universes at one time. And yeah, about the, 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 I think the architectural industry has been a, 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 a real driver here. Um, I mean, this, this year we, we just finished installing a um, four kiloverse installation. Um, we have an eight kiloverse one on the schedule for next year. So kiloverse has, has stopped being a joke term that it was 10 years ago and become a real unit of measure for shows. So as we're transporting this more and more data, we in the the ESTA standard for transporting DMX over a network, we're using multicast. And multicast is a way that you can send to a group. Well, so anytime you have a group, you need ways to join a group, to leave a group, to manage a group, and to know who's in a group. And I think we'll probably spend the next 10 or 15 minutes talking about how that works. But I think we need to take a brief digression over, in the networking world, you often hear the term layers used. And there's several different models, whether you're looking at the internet model or the ISO model, or the, there's various different numbers of layers. But Jason, if I could refer to you, two of the terms that we see a lot are layer two, layer three, and layer four. Why should entertainment technicians care and what do those mean? Um, first of all, uh, if I were hiring one, that would be the first uh, job interview question I would ask. What's the difference between layer two and layer three? Because if you get into networks, it's as important as knowing the difference between the, you know, power and control. It, it's the layer at which things operate. It's the level of intelligence involved in something and it's how that data is distributed. So layer one refers to the the lowest layer of communication, which is the physical layer. So, I mean, if you're thinking DMX, you're talking about a DMX cable. If you're thinking uh, Ethernet, you're thinking about most likely a twisted pair of copper cable or a fiber optic cable. And that's literally how the bits get on the wire from one end to the other. But then you have to pick those bits up and make sense of them. So, for DMX, layer two, you can think of as the actual DMX packet. Uh, for streaming Ethernet, it's the layer two uh, media access controller layer of the packet. And that just gets you communication from one point to the next point. And sometimes that's a shared medium where you're talking to multiple people in the same uh, segment as in a wireless application. And sometimes it's a dedicated channel where you're speaking just one-to-one, -one, and that would be in a switched Ethernet uh, situation. Then once you leave your local area, and if you're building a show off of one switch and it's not connected anywhere else but to your console and, and your, uh, your node, that's it. You'd only have a layer two segment. But when you get into a larger application, you will have multiple layer two segments and the way you communicate between them is through layer three protocols. And layer three is where IP, internet protocols, um, and the sub protocols of that TCP and UDP, uh, that's when those really become important. And when you try to take multicast beyond that layer two segment, it stops being simple and other protocols are required to support it. So, so it used to be that layer two was effectively everybody on the same wire. Layer three was you had to talk via another computer, aka router, to, to get off, to get between layer three segments. So, you know, typically you had your layer two segment, which is those you can talk to directly, and your layer three segment where you had to be routed. Those terms are no longer as strictly defined as they once were, but the concepts are still important. Now, because they're no longer as strictly defined as they once were, there's some changes that have been. Maya, when was the last time you saw a collision on an Ethernet network? Which I can before. Uh, Where I'm getting probably, at is probably a couple days ago now. What, how have networks changed since all the bad things you heard about in the days of 10 megabit Ethernet? Where, you know, when you try and get more than traffic, the congestion collapse, a lot of the bad things that you used to hear about Ethernet, 
don't really exist anymore. I mean, What's changed and why? Everything got bigger. The pipe got bigger. The pipe got bigger. You've got a point-to-point -point connection with switched networks. Um, we've got, instead of having hubs everywhere, we've got switches and routers who are taking a lot of the burden away. We're able to segment things off now. Full duplex. Absolutely. So a lot of the things you used to hear just don't apply anymore. But the concepts of a layer two network, which is, think of it as in the same room with you, and they can hear you if you shout, aka broadcast, and then being able to get elsewhere of layer two and layer three still apply. Now, it's worth pointing out that all those problems uh, Eric just mentioned still exist. They're called wireless networks. <laughs> and you do see collisions and you do see issues uh, in wireless shared medium networks, uh, which is why most people will choose a wired network for show critical data. And actually, that's a really good point, Jason. Let's take a few minutes at the end to make sure we talk about the, the differences in Wi-Fi versus wired networks. So when you're looking at a layer two network and you're dealing with multicast, the word you need to know or the acronym you need to know is IGMP. Internet Group Management Protocol, something like that. I should have looked that up. Yep. Remember how we said that you need a way, well, anytime you have a group, you need to be able to join the group, leave the group, know who's in the group, and manage the group. Wayne, do you want to give a little kind of basic overview of what happens when you're using IGMP? What does it do and why should you use it? Sure. Um, I mean, essentially, if you, if you just back up for a moment to the, 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 the three forms of casting, um, yeah, broadcasting is one to all. That's fairly easy. Unicasting is one to one. That's fairly easy. Um, multicasting, in principle, is easy because you're talking about one, one to a group. So, as you said, you've got to join a group um, in order to receive multicast data. And that's where IGMP um, comes in. Um, the problem is that depending on what infrastructure you're working with, um, you may or may not have the, uh, the IGMP working for you. And one of the problems that we've been dealing with recently is um, support calls where people are using streaming ACN, they know that it's multicast, they know that multicast is good, and what they don't realise is that if you haven't got the right infrastructure, if you haven't got IGMP working for you, um, that your switches will probably just convert it to broadcast. But my switch has the word IGMP in its dash. Why isn't it just fixing it for me? <laughs> because you need because the IGMP needs to be able to work and that needs the network infrastructure. And if you've got a simple layer to uh, switch in there, it isn't going to happen. So let's walk through a packet flow. And this is going to really, you know, when you, and this is something that many times your operating system takes care of for you. But in the case of many embedded systems like we see in this industry, the developer, the advanced user, the systems integrator needs to be aware of this. So Scott's sitting across the table from me. I'm going to use Scott as an example. I come on, I want to receive E1.31 streaming ACN data. Hey Scott, you're my multicast router. I want to, I want to join Universe 7. Okay. Scott now knows, I've told the network, I want to listen to Universe 7. Now we'll point out, Scott said okay, but in the network, twice call IGMP snooping. You just have to say it, and the network infrastructure hears it. There's not necessarily a positive acknowledgement that you have joined, except you start receiving information. So, you say that you want to join the group. And, we'll get to versions of IGMP a bit later, you can leave a group. But you only announce when you join and when you leave. Between that, the network infrastructure has to maintain your subscription to that multicast address. A multicast address is a universe in streaming ACM. You don't want to keep sending everything to everybody who ever listened to it. So there's something called an IGMP querier. If you don't have an IGMP querier on your network, your network isn't working for you the way that it could. I announce my membership to Scott. 
or I announce my membership to the network, and my multicast router, or who will then periodically say, are you still interested in this? Are you still there? Just because I joined the universe last week doesn't mean I still want it now. And if you just kept adding and adding and adding and never deleting, suddenly you're going to be sending everything everywhere anyway. So one of the key takeaways from this is that if you don't have an IGMP query on your network, it's not working. Um, Maya, do you want to talk about where the IGMP query runs? Who do you get it from? Okay, Jason, do you want to talk about so, that? The, going back to the layer two versus layer three discussion, uh, if you'd asked me 10 years ago what the difference between a layer three and a layer two device is, I would easily tell you a layer two device is called a switch, a layer three device is called a router, and we don't really have any layer four devices. Uh, these days those are called firewalls for the most part. Um, but it was a very dark line. Now that's not so much the case. Uh, you have switches that have a lot of advanced layer three capability. So you have a network switch that's kind of a combination of a router and a switch, uh, really depending on how you set it up. Uh, you still certainly have dedicated routers, and those are important in large enterprises. But you can build an entire uh, entertainment network out of exclusively layer three capable switches and be very successful. So the way a switch works, and this is a little bit of under the hood stuff, but I think it's interesting, and I, I think it helps people understand how their networks work. Switches are based on hardware, fundamentally. And that's how they're able to handle the fire hose of data. And it really is amazing how much bandwidth the modern switch can handle. I mean, we're talking terabits of data. And what you end up with is a system where everyone can communicate at the full speed possible coming to their network port with any other port without losing any information. And if you had a single processor involved in that communication, it would choke and die immediately. So if you think about that, that's great, except not everything can be predicted ahead of time. Not everything can be etched into gates in a chip. Not everything can be solved with hardware. So there's a, we affectionately call the punt path, which is every switch has the ability to handle, I would say, 90% of what comes through it in hardware. And then that 10% that it can't quite figure out gets kicked out to the CPU to handle those special cases. And the CPU also helps with coordinating and setting up these uh, configurations of the hardware so that it can then get out of the way and help everyone else out. So what you do with IGMP is you're not really talking to the hardware, you're talking to the CPU, or rather the CPU is listening. And it's seeing that port six now wants to be receiving universe eight and it'll put an entry in the hardware table that will allow port six to get address eight. And then periodically that CPU will come back behind and operate that query process and ask all of its ports, hey, are you still listening to this? And if they are, it maintains the table entry. If you're not, it will delete it. So there's uh, essentially this kind of uh, dance going on between the CPU and the hardware maintaining the state of the network. And that is what's required for a single switch to keep this going. When you now need to coordinate with multiple switches across a large network, say in a theme park situation or something like that, then suddenly those switches have to talk to each other. And they need certain protocols to achieve that. And that's where life gets more interesting. But also that's where you start to see uh, that you have a problem, and if you configure these protocols correctly, you won't have the whole system buckle under you. But if you try to send every universe of every protocol to every switch across an entire theme park, it will buckle and fail. So you really do need these advanced features. Scott, we have a question in the room here. Yeah, so, so, so one question is, um, as you said, you, you tell the switch, you announce to the switch that you're, you know, you're interested in this universe of data, this multicast group, and then it will then route that traffic to you. And as a as a device, I only send that join message once, you know, when I come up, and I send it once when I leave. So what happens if the uh, switch somewhere in the middle that's tracking all of this, the managed switch, 
if that gets rebooted or becomes disconnected, or the user goes up and moves, you know, the cable from one port to another on the switch, uh, how does the system handle a situation like that? Periodically, your IGMP query will ask the network what out, what's out there and what are you interested in. So when you do lose your subscriptions in a way that you don't know about it, the querier will come along and rebuild that state for you. Now, in a show type of environment, that's not fractions of a second. That can be tens of seconds, minutes, a really long time to sit stuck in a queue that you don't want to be sitting stuck in. So in a managed switch, is that configurable? Your IGMP querier time is configurable. Okay. Yes. So, I'm going to break this down a little bit so you, to help people know about what you need to think about. In a small network, in a small system, you probably don't have to think about this. If your IGMP snooping, your IGMP infrastructure isn't working properly, your switch is just going to treat everything like broadcast. It's going to go out every port, everything's going to go everywhere, but as long as you've got enough bandwidth and your devices can handle it, that's perfectly all right. For a couple of universes, a handful of universes, a small amount, no problem at all. So that's normally what an unmade switch behaves activity today, isn't it? Correct. Then, but when you get into a medium system where you're still on the single layer two segment, but you need to really use that bandwidth. You have multiple devices, some of which can handle only four universes, some of which can handle only one, some of which are a media servers and need 50 universes. You need to make sure your IGMP infrastructure is working properly. And when you get into the really big stuff, you get into multicast routing, which we'll touch on briefly at the end. In a layer two only network, when you're not routing, typically in a routed network, your multicast router takes care of running your IGMP query. But when you're not doing multicast routing and you're just doing it within a layer two segment, you need an IGMP query somewhere on the network. Wayne, do you want to... There's a question, question coming in <clears throat> real quick. Just, uh, what, it, what happens in a network if you set up more than one query? Don't do that. <laughs> Good, answer. Good answer. I believe the euphemism is administratively scoped. Yes. So there do, there do seem to be some features in IGMP v2 for query or election. The newer versions of v2, and I don't remember if it was v2 or v3, do have some features to do that. But as a network administrator, you want to know where your query is running. But thanks for that question. Wayne, we cut you off. No, that's fine. Um, I think the, uh, th this is one of the key issues that's coming up with, with support calls um, all over the place at the moment where <clears throat> people are getting into using the streaming asynchronous in a big way. And yeah, we're seeing that kind of transition between um, as you were saying, of the kind of four, six, eight, ten universes, it's fine. It's, it, the, the, the multicast is being converted to, to broadcast. Most of your gateways and nodes are going to be handling that. It's fine. You start to ramp that up to 20 universes or 40 universes. Um, the network bandwidth can handle it, but your gateways are going to start to, to, to crunch under the strain. And by gateways, you mean what we would typically call an output node yeah. in, 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 in this industry. industry. Something that takes DMX converter or right. takes packets from the network and puts Absolutely. them on a DMX. Absolutely. And one of the problems here is that um, if you're just running layers and you haven't got the query up um, in place, you, we're, we're finding that lots of users are saying, well, streaming ACN, it's multicast, that's good, we're fine. And they don't know they have a problem until it stops working. Um, and one of the bigger problems is that with a lot of switches, how they handle multicast data in a non-query uh, non situation isn't actually that, that well defined. You'll find some manufacturers that will actually just kind of block multicast and throw it away. You'll find others that will just stream it out to every port, which is essentially converting it to broadcast, which is bad. Um, and as we were talking about this morning, you'll find some where they will do one of those two things, and it will change the moment um, you know, a 
a product is plugged into one of those ports. So it's becoming it's becoming a real problem out there. And one of the things that we've been um, you know discussing at these meetings is ways for end users to try and understand whether they have an issue or not. Um, and one of them is really to use network um, sniffing products, Wireshark, that kind of thing. And you know, if you've got your layer two switch and you're, if you've, you've got your switch and you're trying to understand whether multicast is working well for you or not, um, you can actually just plug Wireshark into an unused pool. And if you see streaming ACN coming up there, then that's bad. It shouldn't be. Um, so those, those are the kind of tools that we've been discussing about how end users, how lighting engineers that are dealing with networking can start to understand whether they've got an issue or not. And, and I, I think that's a, a good point. That, and it does create some, some bad habits in the industry and some misperception about the quality of certain components versus the other. Uh, how many people have talked to someone who said they had a problem where uh, when they removed their DMX terminator, the network started working, and they'll never use the terminator again. Oh, I see it every day on the internet. So uh, that's a case of pushing the balloon. You squeeze here, and the problem goes somewhere else. And people have that same experience with their network infrastructure. They'll say, well, I have this $30 switch that I bought at Fry's, and my network works great, but I have this $300 switch that I bought uh, you know, maybe also with fries, and whenever I plug this in, nothing seems to work right. And, and it's fundamentally not understanding where your problem is. And there are some simple steps, and I think that's by far the best one to start with. If you have your streaming ACN leaking out ports that haven't joined the IGMT, then you have a problem. And, and you're right, there is a big variance in the implementation that people often confuse the IGMP protocol from the switch function called IGMP snoopy. <coughs> There is a standard by the IETF for IGMP. It is well established. We can all go read it. IGMP snooping, there is no standard for how to do that function. That is something invented by each networking company, and some do it better than others. I think it's also worth pointing out, you know, the problem uh, in this case can not just be the switches we're talking about, but actually in the product themselves. For a product that I develop, um, I implemented streaming ACN in a couple of years ago. It's been working great, no issues. And I recently had started doing testing with an auto-managed network and discovered it wasn't working. And, and I dug into it and I dug down deep and I actually found the problem wasn't with the switch. It wasn't with um, my code in the product. It was actually a bug in the library for the, um, for the, the CPU platform that's built their multicast library actually had a bug in it where it wasn't sitting, sending a bit properly to notify managed switches in the IPMP joint. Um, so it's really important that, you know, for, for a manufacturer, that they actually do test their stuff on, you know, a managed switch because it might work great in the shop on, on the, and everything looks like it's working, but it can actually still have a flaw. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the great things about the plug test here is in addition to testing, Legacy RS-485, we also make a considered effort to make equipment available to test that sort of thing. The joke has long been in this industry, the more money you spend on your switch, the more time you have to spend configuring it. And if you didn't configure the IGMP behavior, you don't know what it's going to do. Maya, most small systems can still get away with the $30 off the shelf switch. Where, at what, you know, where do you see the lines as drawing? How big of a system does it need to be before you really need to start thinking about this at all? Wow, that's a tough question. I mean, when we talk about small systems, I and mean, we've got people, schools that are running on a single universe, and I mean, of course we're not going to see any of the problems there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the issue starts happening when we've got like multi-venue spaces where they're not doing any partitioning, or we've got something big, you know, something like a large conference center or a theme park size. I mean, at some point when we start using, I mean, even more than like 30 different universes, we're getting into the point where we have to start paying attention to these things and can't get away with just going and grabbing some random piece of hardware. I think it's also, you know, one of the questions that comes up a lot is uh, a lot of facilities and uh, even some, you know, touring shows and productions 
uh, makes a lot of use of VLAN. So how does how does um, you know a VLAN network that's got multiple VLANs for different departments, different functionalities, how does that affect uh, multi gaps? Wayne, do you want to take this one? Um, I, I think it, in, in the sense of the question we're talking about, it doesn't really have any significant um, uh, effect because VLANs are really about compartmentalizing the bandwidth on the network. Um, and the the issue with multicast being um, unexpectedly turned into broadcast um, is much more about the processing power of network infrastructure, you know, gateways, DMX converters, that kind of thing, than it is about bandwidth. Um, it's very unlikely that you're you know, with 100 base T or gigabit, whatever. It's very unlikely with any reasonably sized show that you're going to run out of bandwidth because this is happening on the wire. It's going to be the electronics that, that has the problem. Um, so I don't. I think the, the the simple answer to that question is the VLAN doesn't really relate. Well, so I guess uh, an example as I've seen come up is um, let's say I've got my my wife is all you know pretty much on one network. I mean, in some cases you might have. A domain net on one on one VLAN and streaming HDN on another VLAN and media servers are on another VLAN. So if I need to get my streaming HDN data, um, you know, from the lighting network VLAN over to the media server VLAN, for example, like what do I need to know from that? So you what a VLAN is. Let's take a step back. Uh, what a virtual LAN is. Is it the ability to take one? It used to be if you wanted to have multiple broadcast domains, multiple uh, local links, you had to have multiple switches. Multiple and, pumps. Well, sure. Um, and then people saw that was silly. You don't. You might want to have uh, a really common use of this in the enterprise is for voice. You don't want someone downloading uh, or streaming video from Netflix to interfere with the call quality on your phone. So you'll put the phones on one segment, and you'll put uh, the just you know the laptops or the wireless access points on a separate one, and then they don't interfere with each other, and you can treat them as two virtual LANs. And because of that, pretty much every piece of managed networking equipment in the past decade supports this really well. And, and what it ends up being is there's just another couple bits of address space involved in deciding where a port goes. Uh, and you can split up and assign a different VLAN to multiple ports. You can even have one port with multiple VLANs being transmitted over it. Um, it's called trunking, very useful, and, uh, and it's a great feature. And really, this was more important when there was more broadcast traffic in the show network, when that was the case. Um, and if you're dealing with legacy equipment uh, that's broadcast heavy, then you're going to want to use VLANs to segment. Um, because what you're doing with a VLAN is you're essentially doing manually what uh, IGMP does with multicast traffic automatically for you. Um, but if you want to go between VLANs, you, VLANs exist at layer two. If you want to go between VLANs, you need a router. You need a layer three device. Now, most switches are capable of that. So you can actually, uh, within a single switch, it's very simple. If you have multiple switches, then they have to you know, the same issue comes up with unicast, you would have multicast, they need a routing protocol to talk to each other so that they can coordinate who has which VLAN, which subnet, and at what point they cross over. You don't want to have them crossing over in multiple places for various reasons. Um, the same way you don't want to have uh, two patch cords between two dumb switches. Uh, so a, a quick aside, in the column of things that can go terribly wrong, and I, I certainly think they can go terribly wrong in a show network, um, is that $30 switch is great up until you have 10 of them and someone accidentally puts in a redundant link. Now you have basically created a feedback loop and those small switches are too stupid to realize what they're doing. And that first packet through goes to switch one, then that goes to switch two, and then that redundant link takes it back to switch one and back to switch two and things get amplified to the point where um, you, you can take down a show network very quickly, and those are notoriously difficult to debug because you have to find that redundant link. So before we go on to how do you get the multicast traffic between the layer three, this is a really good segue into let's talk about things that can go wrong. We've talked about that when your IGMP, your IGMP infrastructure isn't working, 
But there's a couple of other things that commonly bite these kind of networks. Maya, do you want to talk about storm control? Okay. Wayne, do you want to broadcast limit in storm control? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it, it, again, it kind of relates more back to the, 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 the bad, or, bad old days of, of everything being broadcast related. Um, but the, uh, but it, it does relate to Mastercast as well. The, the, the concept was that when a, when a switch suddenly saw um, a large increase in packet data flow, it was probably a fault. It might have been a feedback loop, as we were just talking about, um, or something similar. Um, the, the, the big problem that we have in, in writing networks is that, unfortunately, that fault scenario has exactly the same signature as most writing consoles when you pay the grandmaster to pull. So, <laughs> yep. And so many network switches, it goes by many names. Storm control, broadcast limiting, what else, I don't know what other names we've seen, but the basic idea is that if they see most IT networks, 1% or less of multicast traffic. A lot of switches, if they see 5%, 10%, so many packets per second worth of multicast and or broadcast traffic, they decide that's a fault and cut it off. Usually in the middle of your, of your cut to black for the intermission. If you're seeing things that work fine in static and then suddenly stop working when you run a big queue or a big fade or get very steppy, storm control is one of the first things to look at. You need to find a way to turn it off in your switch, and if you can't turn it off in your switch, you need a different switch. It goes by a million different names, but in our networks, you basically want broadcast limiting, rate limiting, storm control for both broadcast and multicast turned off. Now that said, the, the thing to keep in mind is these are features that serve, serve purposes. And the problem is the people who design these features and set the configuration defaults have never heard of streaming ACN. So while it, there is, it's one of these things where with great power comes great responsibility, uh, if you want to protect yourself from certain other sorts of issues, one can configure these features to work for you. The problem is by default they work against you. So uh, read the manual, understand what the traffic to your switch looks like, and once you understand those two things, it, it can be used for good. But if you don't want to invest the time to really understand what an appropriate set of thresholds is for your network, then uh, Eric's suggestion is by far the best. Shut it down. And I think it's also worth noting that um, you mentioned streaming ACN, but really this problem is actually common to just about all of the entertainment light industry protocols, whether it's a you know a public protocol or a proprietary protocol, um, most of all of the entertainment uh, light industry protocols are affected by this setting. Okay. I just want to say that you know, with, with these kind of situations, we, we've been talking about how to respond to there being a problem. <clears throat> but there's, there obviously there's a lot to be said for testing and understanding what the variables are in your network. And um, you know, th th this isn't an advert because the software is free, but we put out um, a piece of software called Bandwidth Tester, which can output um, thousands of universes of streaming ACN, of ShowNet, of KineNet, of ArtNet, um, and it can do it broadcast, it can do it unicast, it can do it multicast, and its purpose is to break networks but its purpose is to break them before the curve goes up, so you actually know what your problem is and you can fix it. Let's see if you can plan ahead and you don't have that tool available. What kind of queue sequence can you write to prove this at load in and to know whether your infrastructure is going to do the show? And maybe I'll take this one here. Your effects engine works for you here. Mm -hmm. lots, of lots of sine waves, running on all of your universes fast. Now, now let me play devil's advocate here and ask, what, and maybe Maya, from a perspective, can comment. Uh, what does that change? Is, is 131 really slowing down when there isn't a chase running? And, and what do these things uh, 
do to really help you find these problems? I mean, the, the big thing is is spreading out over a bunch of different universes. I mean, uh, 131 is still going, but it's the hardware on the system that's suddenly having trouble. It, it's the stuff that's not our entertainment component that's having the trouble processing it. Because, because like Scott was saying before, uh, nobody else uses networks the way that we do. We have a ridiculously huge number of multicast addresses, which when you're sending all sorts of other protocols, you might be using a handful of them. I mean, we're, we're talking about allocating one for each of 64,000 plus universes. And I mean, that's, that's a huge difference, and the switches aren't, aren't ready for that. I think there's maybe another point, I don't know if Jason's getting at this or not, but this is also another factor here, is that uh, we're streaming HDN and again with many of the other live industry protocols, is that when you're in a static look, when values aren't changing, it's not sending packets as fast. So uh, in the case of streaming HDN, if I have a static queue, then and there's no cross phase happening, then it will just send the DMX packet, you know, over the uh, over um, the network, um, you know, maybe once a second or so, just to, you know, let me know that, that the controller is still there and keep alive. Um, but if there's a phase happening, if I'm doing a cross phase or running the effects engine, um, then values are constantly changing. So I'm going to be spinning, you know, at least, you know, 40, 40 packets a second out per universe. Um, and with recent provisions of, of streaming AC and then just released for things like LED fixtures to make them more responsive, uh, you could be sending them out as fast as you want. You send out 120 frames a second for the universe if you want to. Um, just, just to add to, to Scott's comment, this also relates to um, the DMX player as well, bearing in mind that a lot, a lot of the time what we're doing here is we are converting to DMX and RDM for you know, the, the last 20 feet. Um, and a lot of the time, DMX will also be synchronized to network packets so that when you're running video walls, video walls, and things like that, you don't get nasty, uh, nasty effects and aliasing. Um, so when you're testing the network here, you're going to probably be changing your DMX refresh rates as you're testing your network and you're upping and downing the ACM previous rates. So we've talked about making sure that your IGMP infrastructure is working for you. We've talked about storm control rate limiting. Another problem we also see is that some switches, some network infrastructure, can only forward multicast and broadcast packets at the speed of the slowest connected device. This depends on how it's architected internally. And unless you have access to the people who designed it, you're never going to know how, they, how this works. I will say a pretty good indicator has to do with the uh, amount you paid for it. It's not perfectly correlated, but that tends to be a feature of lower end switches. So how common is this still? I mean, I know this used to be common. I remember at high end we talked about this 10 years ago, it was a very common problem. But how common is it still today in newer stuff? And what kind of grade of switch do you see this in? There is no hard and fast rule. We've seen there are some technical, the, the fancy term is virtual input queuing, I believe, that does resolve this without adding a ton of memory to the switch. And with that, but it, it is still, it's still very much out there, even with newer gear. Um, where it the, th the reason it's gotten a lot better is that it used to be that the fast ports were the 100 megabit ports and the slow stuff was the 10 megabit. A lot more now, it's the fast stuff is the gigabit and the slow stuff is the 100 megabit. Or the 10 gig and the 20 gig. But where this comes in, that one 10 megabit device that you plug in can take down everything else or can cause problems for everything else on that switch. It seems totally counterintuitive. But if, it, if, the, if the packets are coming in and they're waiting on input to be able to be output, That that train is only moving as slow as the as the as fast as the slowest port. And if you see that behavior, that is almost never configurable. Is there anything you can look at? I know you put on that managed switch. You know, you look at the data sheet of it. There's you know 50 to 100 different IEEE you know protocols, standards of references that you know people are unmanaged switch so even supports. Is there anything at all you can look at in terms of the data sheet to get an idea? 
uh, whether this, this might be a problem for you. If you see the virtual, in, if you see the phrase virtual input queuing, you may have better luck. Sometimes that shows up. If you see no head of line blocking, if, but realistically, it's not standardized by IEEE. The internal behavior of a switch is not standardized. Really, buy five and return the four that don't work. One of the ways that you can um, test this once you've got the switch in play is to actually connect a low speed device to it when you're running the sequences. So if, you, you know, if, if you've got a laptop where you can set your MIT to run at 10 minutes T, there are some left, um, then get your lighting system running some fast uh, moving effects and plug Wireshark into one of the ports with the 10 base T connection and see if it glitches. We find that's a, you know, a really good way to get an indicator of whether you're going to have problems with from a show part. And we, we said plug wire, plug in and running Wireshark. Why is it running Wireshark in this case? Uh, it, 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 I don't, it doesn't have to be Wireshark. A, anything that's actively on the network. Okay, I wasn't sure if you were looking at getting a point like when it was just over a line test traffic or anything like that. No, because you, you would have to have um, set up for mirroring for that to be useful to you. Sure. If, if you have the network knowledge, you can actually look at, it's not called the sequence number, but there is a monotonically increasing number in the streaming ACN packet that you can look at. And if you see that counter go 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, 12, 21, 35, you're probably missing packets. But it's a great tool to have if you know how to use it. Yeah. Now, we've just mentioned a feature of a managed switch, which is worth its weight in gold. I don't want to let slip by, and that is port mirroring. Um, different people call it different things. Cisco calls it spam, stateful port analyzer. Um, there, there are various ways of doing it. The idea is the same. Uh, it used to be if you wanted to see the traffic going in port 6, you uh, unplug port 6, plug port what was there into a hub, plug your laptop into the hub, and plug the hub into port 6. Well, good luck finding a hub these days. And even the things that call themselves hubs are actually more switchy than they are hubs. So this doesn't work anymore, but to the rescue is port mirroring. And all you're doing is you're configuring the switch to say, everything going in or out of port 6, send a copy to port 10. And port 10 essentially becomes dead. So you will get a copy of all, the, all that data going to a laptop running Wireshark, and now you can see all of that traffic. You can detect packet loss. It's really the, you know, it's step one for debugging. Uh, for an end user, it's probably about step 10. For an engineer developing a product, it really should be step one. You need to see the packets on the wire, and you need a switch capable of that. Uh, so that does mean you need at least what they call a lightly managed switch, um, you know, a, a what, managed cell shoes, lost Yeah, or? something that at least has an interface that lets you tell it which port needs to go to switch. where. Switch. Um, because a, a totally unmanaged switch, there's no way to communicate that information. And these are available for under $100 from Amazon today. Uh, I know even in our small business uh, group, we have some very capable switches that can do exactly that. So it, it, they're very affordable. Don't think it's something you have to buy a $10,000 switch to do. Um, and I would advise you know, any technician on a large show to have one in their bag. So it looks like we're going to go a few minutes over. Hopefully that's OK. There are a few things we want to cover. We've talked about making sure your IGMP is working. We've talked about rate limiting. We've talked about how plugging in one slow device can wreck the performance of that entire switch. But there's another gremlin. It's the conspiracy theory packet. It's out there. Flow control. <laughs> flow control sounds good. Flow control is how a device can say, I'm not keeping up. Stop sending me stuff. Really nice when you're FTPing a file. Really nice when you're looking. Really bad for streaming networks. When you're transporting DMX over a network, I'd rather have the most current data than all of the data. The technical term is isochronous. I don't care what it was 50 milliseconds ago. I want to know what it is now. If you have one device that says, I can't keep up, stop, and it sends that out, depending on how the network is, is implemented and depending on the switch, 
that can tell that switch to stop sending, and anything that's plugged into that switch to stop sending, and anything that's plugged into that switch to stop sending. One device saying stop somewhere on the network can cause something three hops away to think that it needs to stop sending. That really weird old laptop that you that is running in some sort of management mode that you left plugged in and suspended in the office, yep, it really can mess up your entire network. And unfortunately, it's the conspiracy theory packet. You can't see it, but it controls everything. Because when you try and look at it with Wireshark, unless you're using a special NIC that is intended to see these, the NIC in your laptop is going to absorb it. The, typically, the only way to know if these are happening is to look at the port counters in a lightly managed or web managed switch or better and see if you're seeing flow control assertions. And if you are, turn off flow control on the switch and get that device off your network because you will have no hair left because it will have all been pulled out. I think, I think part of what you're talking about here and kind of one of the overarching themes that, that we've been edging on but haven't actually said is talking about isolating the infrastructure or lighting network from the rest of your IT infrastructure. And as a matter of fact, one of the questions that was just put in the room, Milton Munch, Milton's mantra, if you connect your lighting system to the internet, you will get what you deserve. <laughs> if you connect it to the office network, things are going to get interesting. Let, let me put it this way. If you connect it naively, there are safe ways to do this. People do, and for good reason, uh, but that is done by someone who is an expert in IT. I do see it happen a lot on shows. Even, even the pictures of shows out there, I see it frequently happening because Hey, I need to download a, a profile for this, you know, for the new iPhone console. I need to download the latest content update from the graphics designers that are somewhere else, load into the media server. So um, it does. As, as Milton said, it's a, it's a bad idea, but unfortunately, it's so seductive that it is occurring quite often, even amongst you know the biggest professionals out there on the biggest shows. But let's, let's not just use something that has multiple network interfaces that's capable of doing that at the same time. No, no, I'm talking about actually it. Actually connecting it to your office network. There are some really slick products out there that are doing a whole bunch of watching of your system that can actually, you know, collect that information, put it on a web page somewhere, and that's fine as long as those interfaces are, are separated, as long as there's one that's running on the lighting network and one that's talking to the office network. The actual internet or something like that. Yeah. And it's. I think Wayne wanted to. Oh, oh, sure. We also had a question come in about. I, I was just. I was just going to make the point about that. You know, a lot of a lot of these um, features are, are, are things that, from a switch manufacturer, are considered to be clever features. You know, storm control we talked about, um, flow control we talked about. Um, it's one of the reasons that before multicast and streaming ACN were, were active in our industry, the recommendation would be to use an unmanaged switch because it didn't have the clever stuff going on. That's no longer a relevant recommendation because we need managed switches. But uh, you know, my mantra is when you take it out of the box, log into its web browser and turn off the clever things that are going to cause you problems and flow control Storm control, the two things that you should just wait to switch off at the beginning. So we had a question come in. Um, why does ETC recommend not having MA net on the same VLAN, aka network, as net three, even though both are multicast? Do you want to take that or do you want me to? Well, I think we can trade off on this one. I mean, it's, it's what we've been saying before. Right? And uh, net three is an interesting thing to say because net three for ETC is actually streaming ACN and ACN and that family of things. So for those of the protocols that we've been talking about for part of the day, um, and we were just talking about before about the, the uh, multicast addresses that we've got allocated for use of streaming ACN, and, and it's the same thing that we've been saying about combining systems here. You know, we've got uh, one setup and a, an amount of traffic in there, and we're going to have some sort of can, can you do it? You probably can. Uh, if we've got these two different systems and they're all passing all the traffic around, well, why don't we separate them? I'm going to back. I'm going to do one one um, 
possible explanation I can have for that also is that um, on the M8 systems, um, their implementation of streaming HCM um, always comes out of the same physical network port on the back of the uh, console that M8 comes out of. They share the same net. So if you're using M8 net and you may not really be intending to use streaming HCM, but it has to be turned on. Um, and EDC does use streaming HCM in their system, you can easily end up with you know, um, you know, the universe is colliding, and then whoever has the highest priority set in the packet kind of wins. So that, that's one um, obvious problem I'm, I'm aware of that could occur. Um, on an MA console, for example, the, you know, ARTNET comes out of a different, a different NIC on the back of the report, so you don't have to worry about it, it um, you know, being a collision. But um, the MA net and, and uh, should be able to use shared things as a interface. So, I think the biggest the biggest thing to know is that if you are if you are using a main net, you're trying to put on the same VLAN as you can do. So make sure you coordinate, you know, what streaming ACM universes are coming out of the MA call. I'm gonna back this up a little bit and kind of go from my time when I was working at high end. Generally the easiest advice to give is don't mix them. If you're in a situation where you really need to do it, plan on spending some time on the phone with tech services because you have to coordinate the multicast addressing. You have to coordinate the multicast group assignments, not only for between the DMX transport protocols like you know, streaming ACN and the other ones, but also between the console to console communication where they're doing database lookups and other things. And there's everybody looks at the IETF and the ICANN and the IANA assignments and makes the same decisions. And so we see cases where we have the proprietary protocols using the same or similar multicast ranges as multicast addresses, because you don't own a multicast address as some of the other things. It can be done. In Hogland, it was, we had to give you certain system numbers in, or tell you to use certain universes, but the easiest and will always work is to keep them separate, and you need to know what you're doing when you want to merge. When you have yeah, I mean, I, I would just expand on, on Scott's comment, which I think is related to the, the kind of physical MA consoles. We've certainly had experience with their more kind of PC software based ones where actually um, you know, the MA net, the streaming ACM, the ARC net, it's all coming out of the same connector. Um, and whilst in principle that should work, um, you know, the reality is that it's going to break things with that much data coming out. Especially if you haven't, if you haven't explicitly configured it yeah. properly. Yeah. And, and that's where I really think the most important switch in your system is really going to be the one that accepts all of the data coming out of the consoles. Yeah. And that's where the management features are really going to get you out of jail free. Uh, the one in the rig, maybe not so much. So we're at the hour. There are a couple of things that we promised we'd get to later and a couple of key words I want, to, I want to mention just so that you can find them with the web search when you need them. We talked about a lot about what you need to make things work better within a layer two domain. Your IGMP working for you. You know, make sure that you have storm control turned off. Turn off or don't use flow control and make sure that you don't have one device slowing you down. When you need to go between layer two segments, the key word is PIM sparse mode, P-I-M sparse mode. That's protocol independent multicast. It's how you get multicast routed at a layer three level. When you need to get between networks, it's, uh, it's PIM sparse mode. So is this how you go between two VLANs, for example? How you go between two VLANs. It's how you go from one side of a theme park to the other. It's how you transport stuff across the backbone of a cruise ship. It's generally it's best to keep stuff within a layer two domain, but when you need to get stuff across layer three, PIM sparse mode. At that point, you're probably going to bring a net networking expert onto your show, but that's a really good starting point to know where to go. And the, the most important thing to know about PIM sparse mode is that it allows the network infrastructure to only listen to and only, only request the traffic that it needs. And that's what keeps you from getting every copy of every universe in the entire theme park on every switch. And that's the difference between a successful network and a, and a collapsing one. So I think, since we're over, what I'd like to do is open up the floor for questions. 
And then at the end of the questions, let's do a brief discussion of Wi-Fi. And I'm not going to say why you shouldn't use it, but what you need to know. Um, so, so if, if you do have questions, you're welcome to submit them by the chat panel at this point, or you should be able to take yourself off mute. And we can... We did have one in the chat just a minute ago that I, I, I tried to answer a little bit by text, but I think it's a good question, which is, uh, if you do have a managed switch running IGMP and then you attach an unmanaged switch to one port and dangle a bunch of nodes off of that, what happens? And the, the short answer is, uh, it's, that architecture is better than only having unmanaged switches, but what you're going to do is essentially each, uh, you know, every switch port is aware that it can be connected to additional switches. So they, it's not a, it doesn't assume one device per port. It will basically make list, make additional entries in the table for each additional node you hang off that MNAM switch. And when they perform IGMP, it will suddenly start forwarding that universe as well and that universe as well. Um, keep in mind, IGMP requests are done on a per universe uh, basis in streaming ACN. So you'll have six requests if you have six universes. And if you have four for universe devices, now you'll have 16 groups coming into that unmanaged switch, which is still probably okay, but if you expanded that out to a 48 port switch and with four universes per, now you're starting to pull a, a little bit more, and it might have been better not to use that unmanaged switch. You might be better off having just another managed switch. The other thing I'll add to that, though, is that can be a really good architecture if you have a traffic-intensive core. Between your console and your front-of-house media servers, you're doing 50, 100, 200 universes, you're doing lots of this, you're doing the killiverse, putting the managed switch there, letting it keep that traffic in front of house. And then if you just need to get a couple of universes to your stage manager console or to some trust, you know, you've kept the bulk of that traffic off of the line to the trust, and then the unmanaged switch hanging off there, probably good enough and a little more budget friendly. And, and keep in mind, the, the, the trick, and this plays into another question we just got, which is, at what point, versus at a number of universes, a number of sources, uh, do you really, does IGMP become a requirement? And that's a really hard question to answer, because at, at a fundamental level, the function of IGMP is to prevent broadcast. And the console already has to send every universe, so you're not doing the console any favors there. What you're doing a favor is the fixture, the gateway, whatever that data sync is. And that threshold is going to differ depending on who's uh, streaming ACN to DMX gateway or, or comparable technology, who you buy it from, and how many resources that device has. Uh, there's some on the market that barely scrape by, and there are some that are massively overpowered. And it's one of those things that you, there is no hard and fast rule. Uh, you know you're going to be doing those devices a favor if you give them the ability to ask the switch to filter for them, because that's what you're doing. With IGMP and multicast, we're taking advantage of this existing infrastructure within switches to allow them to start filtering the data for you, so that when the data finally arrives, you don't have as much to pick through, and you have 1 44th of a second to find that next DMX packet and process it. And if you spend all of that time looking for universes you don't care about, that's time wasted you could be spent getting ready for your next refresh. So at, at four universes, you probably don't need to think about it. At 20, you probably ought to at least thought about it, but you might get away without doing anything. At 50, you yeah. better have done some work. You're, you're, you're really limited here by you know, what the amount of processing power in the weakest, you know, the weakest amount of processing power devices you have hanging off of the network that are they're getting, even though it's only interested in this one universe, it's getting traffic for you know 20, 30, 100 others. Um, you know, product, product I've done, I did testing, full load testing with you know sine waves running for 64 universes, and I was good to that. But when I started getting a bit more, I, and I was actually receiving a processing data. But you know, you start to you start seeing fall off. You start seeing a lot of glitchy stepiness, and it'll be the same thing in that that device only needs one universe if it's having to handle a hundred universes with the crack coming into it, because it still has to answer the door every time a packet comes knocking. It still has to answer the doorbell. So I think I think, I think Wayne wanted. I, I just wanted to to throw in one comment, but it's also 
Um, slightly dangerous to talk in terms of universe count here because you know, uh, all of the modern protocols are doing delta transmission. They're only transmitting data when they need to. So 40 universes when you're running a slow fade versus 40 universes when you're running a value is a massive difference. Um, and, and that will you know, affect whether your gateway can actually keep up or not. True, true. So the more you've got you know, a lot of things that are, a lot of universes that are you know, basically static where they're not changing values, not very cost based, but the network looks like almost no traffic at all. But as soon as you start the effects engine running, you know, it's, it's a huge spike in traffic. So, and that, that does make a big difference. Okay, absolutely. So I, I think the, the answer to that is cheap node, expensive switch. Expensive node, and maybe you can get away with a cheaper switch. And test, absolutely test it. Testing in pre-production. Yeah. Um, just for some interesting numbers, uh, 64 universes at 44 hertz with streaming ACN is about 15 megabit. So you've already overrun what a 10 megabit device can do. You have to go pretty far to, to hit saturating gigabit. So as you can see, the, the network infrastructure's speed isn't your problem. You do not need gigabit. Whether you like to think about it or not, what you really need is the, the equipment at either end to be able to handle the data. And there's a lot of things out there I see that have, you know, a gigabit interface takes on or even a hundred megabit interface on, but they can't handle traffic actually coming at them, you know, at that rate. Even though they may have that interface, that doesn't mean that the processor inside can actually handle that amount of data. It's also important to think about the knock-on effects as well, because the, the, you know, these gateway devices, you know, these next of DMX converters, they're doing other things as well. They're dealing with the RDM management. So it may be that it can keep up, but it may well be that by keeping up, you lose all of your infrastructure management of your network. So there's more considerations than just pure bandwidth. Good. Yeah. Other questions do we have? And you're welcome to take yourself off mute, or you're welcome to submit via by the questions panel. All right. So just kind of give us a little bit of feedback here. If you do see underneath the attendee list, there's a check mark or an X. Um, would you please hit the check mark if this was helpful and informative and what you expected, and the X if it's not? Um, and of course, you're welcome to send any of us feed feedback or comments that you may have. Yeah, there's another question that just came out. This is a great question. Um, Part of the reason that the CPWG is starting to focus on IPv6 is because we're discovering that there are a lot of IPv6 only installations and we're missing our chance to get folks who actually know about the lighting industry putting things into uh, lighting equipment, all of these architectural installs. We, we need to jump in there and start getting them back to the point where we're able to operate them at the same time that we're operating our, our theatrical or entertainment lighting stuff. I mean, and the other thing is that we are actually experiencing running out of IP addresses. We're experiencing running out of IP addresses. We're experiencing running out of universes now. And moving to, the, you know, somebody told me once that the lighting industry lagged behind the real world by about 20 years. Um, and we're, 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 up. we're running to catch up. This is, this is, this is our chance. Uh, IPv6 and uh, the expanded address space, the differences in multicast handling are going to allow us to create much more powerful versions of the, the protocols that we already have. And also, I'll add to that, many companies have an absolute all, all equipment must support IPv6 policy, and you're not going to get, you're not, they will not accept your equipment if it doesn't do IPv6. And the U.S. government is one of the largest ones of that. So many, many RFQs, many requests for projects must support IPv6, or you cannot bid on that job. And so this manifests itself on this, you know, I've heard some projects where they're, you know, doing a lot of creative uh, LED lighting uh, bridges and things like that. Well, you have to be able to check the tick box that does IPv6. Now, whether the person reading that form actually understands what that is or not, or even really matters, um, you know, it, it's become a requirement. It's become a sophistication requirement for a lot of companies, um, and especially in the architectural world um, is, is where it's, it's a bigger issue. I think Wayne has a point. Yeah, I'd just like to throw in a kind of international comment on that. Um, I, you know, I'm hearing this um, a, a lot at the, the meeting this week, 
Um, I would just like, like to make the point that my experience is that this requirement is only happening in America. This, this concept of must be able to support IPv6 is not happening anywhere else in the world. We, we hear about from Australia a lot too. Okay. There's, there's a definitely yeah, a very loud community from Australia that we're out there. I mean, I'm not saying that it's bad. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, but, but yeah, it's, it's really kind of a specification yeah. point that's really well, driving it more than anything. You know, um, because online networks are tend to be on our own private networks anyway, you know, behind the map, that, you know, we're using a private address space, so it doesn't really matter so much privacy before. But, you know, the, the industry is moving in that direction as a whole. And at some point, I don't think it's going to be for a long, long time. I'm, I'm one of the ones that kind of drag my feet into the mud here a bit on it. Um, but, you know, at some point, there will come a time where IPv4 will start to get deprecated in, you know, IT systems that were, you know, that we build all of our networks on top of. Um, you know, Microsoft, for example, has slowly been moving their stuff yeah, towards. Like towards. Yeah. Right. I think we have a follow up question in the yeah. room here. Related to IPv6, Jason, earlier you said, IPv6 makes a lot of things easier than IPv4, especially in configuration. Can you give us an example sure. of that? So, um, and actually that was part of the question here was, I spent enough time typing in IPv4 addresses. <laughs> and, and the answer is, if you're mm -hmm. typing an IPv6 address, you're doing it wrong. Well, if you're typing an IPv4 address, Somebody's you doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> But here's the thing, with IPv4 we are getting weak tools to, uh, so there's this concept in networking called zero config. And the idea is, if you plug enough, dev if you plug devices together into the networking hardware and turn it on, it should work. And IPv4 has a lot of hurdles to making that possible. IPv6 solves it. So, so just, just a quick day in the life of an IPv6 device. If you plug an IPv6 device into a network, it's going to power on it's going to first discover its router. And once it gets its router discovery done, it's going to know what subnet it's on. And it's going to know what the universe of possible IP addresses are to be on that subnet. And because there's so many IP addresses available, it can just pick one out of thin air and it's okay. With V4, the problem was you had 256 to pick from and you had to make sure you didn't overlap. With IPv6, it's not a problem. You can pick a random one and you're okay. You can also do the HTTP traditionally. You can do the other you know, static assignment if you want. But for the most part, an IPv6 network can get plugged in, turned on, and immediately start function, functioning. And with a little bit of configuration ahead of time on the network infrastructure, you can do really powerful things with this. And then at that point, using things like uh, some of the features of forthcoming guest standards like E133, such as uh, multicast DNS and, and uh, service discovery, you're able to uh, you're no longer looking for the IP address, typing the IP address of the console. You see the name of the console and you click on it. And, and these are the kind of user experiences that we should be having in this industry. The, the kind of think Apple in the simplicity of, of how you're able to connect to devices on the network without having to worry about the IP address. Uh, which, by the way, consequently, one of the other issues with IPv6 is uh, starting this year, Apple will not accept uh, iTunes store submissions of apps that don't support IPv6. Now what they really mean is they want you to support IPv6 for internet connected functions. We're not internet connected by and large, but you'll see these requirements start to pop up in more and more places where uh, people look down on you if you're not supporting it. And, and the other reality is it's easy. There, you know, we've, we've been tracking what it takes to support IPv6 in these protocols. Uh, the changes occupy you know, maybe 20 lines. It, there's so little to do to do it. It's just kind of a no-brainer. And then we'll see, uh, it really opens up these tools for really easy uh, configuration of networks that will then let the industry kind of go forward. And I, I think once systems really start to flourish under that, I think people just stop wanting to do any, you know, you kind of want to do all those IPv4 things by habit, like assigning IP addresses so DHCP doesn't get screwed up. But, but once you kind of get spoiled a little bit, and the reason people haven't adopted IPv6 is because they have to connect to the internet. So much of the internet doesn't support v6 yet. I mean, you'd be surprised how much does. But you eventually, you have to have v4. But when you're in a lighting network where you're starting from scratch every day, there's no reason to use v4. But with that, we are well over the time that was allocated.
So I would like to thank everybody for attending and thanks particularly our panelists for participating. Um, Wayne, Jason, and Maya, thank you so much. Um, if you do have technical questions about protocols, I really do recommend the rdmprotocol.org website. Um, there's a lot of good technical discussion there, particularly for developer level stuff. Um, and, you know, a lot of the people in this room um, follow that. So, thank you very much for joining. I think we're going to go ahead and end the recording. So, thank you for joining. And everybody, enjoy the balance of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks.